Um, so, and I, again, I appreciated the help from you as we uh, tried to look at some of the Chinese there. So this time I wanna talk about some things related to the last 100 years. And this is what I've called the passing of the torch. And uh, as we come into this time, I wanna ask ourselves this question, uh, to whom will the torch be passed? As we talk about the passing of the torch uh, in the 20th century, and now we're well into the 21st century, uh, to whom will the torch be passed? Well, as we come into that 20th century, then kind of looking back here historically a little bit, who were some of those in the 20th century to whom the torch was passed? So I've got some pictures here and I thought you would enjoy a little guessing game. And I won't tell you right away, but even if you want to give some input, uh, anybody recognize who this lady missionary was of the 20th century? Amy Carmichael. Very good. Very good. Absolutely. Amy Carmichael, who, whoops, I don't want to go there yet. Amy Carmichael who was a missionary to India, you know, she died uh, in, uh, in 1951. Uh, that is within the lifespan of my father and in the lifespan of some of you. Uh, here we read her writings. We look at her as a, kind of a missionary hero. Uh, she was alive when some of you were born. Uh, this, is an, this, is, this is fascinating. Uh, she really is a part of the of the 20th century uh, missions movement, dying in the middle of the 20th century. And of course, her work in Donover, uh, India continues until this day. Uh, there's a Donover, uh, India. And so of course she gave herself to India without a furlough uh, for decades and even in very poor health in her final years uh, was still used of the Lord. I don't know. Anybody recognize this picture? Uh, you can probably guess from the little child she's holding that uh, she was a missionary to China. I'll put up some dates here. Dying in 1970. 1970 was the year that I was born. I don't know. I think you could recognize this is not a well-known picture. Um, this is Gladys Aylward. Gladys Were you going to say that, Mrs. Tang? It's Gladys Aylward. <laughs> yes, very good. Okay. I, I wondered if you were going to say, say something and maybe say that. Very good. Gladys Aylward, a wonderful lady missionary uh, whom God greatly used uh, in China. But again, look at the dates of her life. This is the 20th century. And we look at her as some kind of a distant missionary hero. Um, she's living during our lifetime. Uh, this lady is, is doing a work for, uh, for the Lord. So just some of these uh, missionaries. Here's, here's another lady missionary. I should have pulled out some other pictures of her. I don't know. Uh, Isabel Kuhn. Wow, Mrs. Tang. We should have you be, you should be doing the the 20th century missions here. Wow, this is great. Uh, exactly. Um, you know, she was also in China uh, to the Lisu, uh, the Lisu tribes in China. So more of the tribal group on the, what would that be? The, I guess the Southwestern, uh, the Southwestern side of, of China. Um, but again, look at her now. She was born uh, the same year. As, uh, as Gladys Aylward, but her life was cut short by, by cancer, uh, dying in her uh, upper 50s. Um, but uh, again, here's a lady that's ministering. Um, she's ministering during uh, the lifetime of some of us here in this uh, Zoom room uh, together. Um, and use her and her husband, the Lord used, of course, greatly used through her writings. Uh, many of you have read some of her books. She has lots of books, and I would highly recommend you're reading uh, the, the books of Isabel uh, Kuhn. 
and uh, I could pretty easily give you her. In fact, maybe I should just put her name in the chat. But I don't have access to the chat easily here uh, where uh, I am right now. husband, John Kun, came yes. to G JSM Creek Road to open, oh, wow. open, the, open the mission. Oh, wow. That is really amazing. Do you remember about when that was, Mrs. Ting? Uh, should be around 1964. It was okay. she was he was with his second wife. Okay, so 19 so 1960s 1964. So there is an immediate connection with JSM. So amazing, but you're right, yeah, because uh, Isabel would have died in 57. So by 64, he would have, um, yeah. So anyway, facet. I did not know that. Thank you for mentioning that. That's great. But what, again, wonderful writings, wonderful writings. They'll stir your heart for the Lord as she tells stories of their work among the, the rugged slopes, the steep slopes of China there, southwestern China um, with the Lisu. Uh, any idea who this might be? I'll give you some dates here. There are better pictures. So um, she wrote, she wrote some books. Um, I think she might have written a book about his life. I forget, um, but she's written a couple books, more than one actually. Anybody say Jonathan go, Jonathan go forth. I'm not sure if I heard. Anyway, Jonathan go forth. He was a missionary to China. Um, really used of the Lord in revivals um, and his wife, Rosalind, Jonathan and Rosalind and Goforth. He was blind at the end of, toward the end of his life, but used of the Lord. This is a rugged picture. I, again, I should have showed you some other ones of this guy. Let's see here. This was China, India, and Africa, dying in 1931. So he's a little earlier in the 20th century, actually started his mission work in the 19th, the 19th century. Um, this is uh, C.T. Studd. Were you gonna say that, Brother Jacob? Uh, this is C.T. Studd. So he started off in China. He was uh, uh, one of those recruited by Hudson Taylor in the China Inland Mission. And uh, he um, was a brilliant cricket player brilliant cricket player, had a career, guaranteed career as a cricket player, but gave it up. He was part of the Cambridge Seven, studied at Cambridge and uh, went into missions in China. Came back from China, his health was broken, uh, came back to England, went back to India for a while, came back to Britain. Again, his health was, was terrible. He was about 50 years of age, and uh, got a burden for Africa. The doctor said, you should not go. Your health is terrible. He said something like, I'm going to go anyway. <laughs> and he went. And actually, he did his best work. Really, the mission work for which he's best remembered was the work he did after he was 50 years of age. And uh, spent in life. In fact, he died in Africa. Um, but uh, spent his remaining years in Africa. Um, was a very... A uh, very rugged man, very uh, hardworking, diligent, fervent. Um, he he was a little bit hard to work with because he demanded so much of the people around him. Uh, so he wasn't easy to work with, but um, really had a heart uh, for the Lord. Okay, this i i don't I, I don't expect anybody i he might live in singapore i i don't know for sure where he now lives um but there's a significance to this man he um i'll just go to the next one here he's been the director of omf since 2005 i don't know how you say his name um his his, his english name is patrick and then his last name is Fung, F-U-N-G, Fung, Fung, F-U-N-G. I don't know how you would say it. 
He was born in Hong Kong. Uh, he then uh, served as a medical doctor, medical missions, I should say a missions doctor in medical missions. And uh, then he became the, the, Singa the director, the Singapore director, let me, let me say that differently. He became the international, international director of Overseas Mission Fellowship Singapore. And uh, I think that was in 2001. And then 2005, he was named uh, the director of the overseas, the overall director of Overseas Missionary uh, Fellowship. Now, why is that significant? Well, OMF, of course, is the successor to the China Inland Mission. The China Inland Mission changed its name in, I think, the 1960s. I, I could be wrong. Uh, but the China Inland Mission changed its name about the 1960s to Overseas Missionary Fellowship, known as OMF. Why did they do that? Well, because China was closed uh, as a result of the incoming uh, communism and the driving out of missionaries. Uh, China was no longer an open country. And uh, so, you know, if you're called the China Inland Mission, but you can't have any missionaries in China, you have to change your name. <laughs> so, so they changed their name to the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Well, the significant thing is that Patrick Fung, and I apologize if I'm uh, saying his name like an American, um, but Patrick Fung, what is significant about this man is that he is the first Asian director of the mission board that Hudson Taylor started. So here's Hudson Taylor who has a burden for Chinese. He starts the China Inland Mission. God uses a China Inland Mission for decades. And it comes to the point where they believe the best director of Overseas Missionary Fellowship is a Chinese man. I'm just, I'm just saying that's very significant. Here's an Asian Chinese director of Overseas Missionary Fellowship. He was appointed in December of 2005, really, I think probably starting in 2006 is really the start of his being the overall executive director of OMF. So this is significant in the cause of missions. And again, as we think about the passing of the torch and the, the last you know, 100 years or so, um, what are some significant, what are some things that happen? And I'm just going to move quickly through this. I'm not, I, I don't think you're interested and I'm not interested in, in going through each of these items, but I just want you to see some of the things that are regarded as significant uh, in the last, in the last 100 years or so. Um, and this is going to, this is going to lead us into some, some trends in, in, in missions. So I'm just going to throw out some names here. We start off in the 19, 1910 to 2010 uh, era. Uh, Borden dies. I didn't mention him, but he was a missionary with the China Inland Mission. He wanted to reach Islamic peoples in China. He died in Egypt of uh, cerebral meningitis. I mentioned C.T. Studd. Showed you the picture of that rugged man. Uh, the World Ev Evangelization Crusade is actually the name of the organization that he started. And uh, that, that exists today. Uh, it's no longer called crusade because they, uh, that the word crusade kind of has bad connotations today uh, if you're reaching Islamic people. So I think today it's called something like the World Evangelization Fellowship. But uh, my wife and I actually met some missionaries uh, with them uh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, very significant uh, missions uh, missions organization was the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Uh, this was uh, started by A.B. Simpson. Uh, I believe he's the one that wrote To the Regions Beyond uh, the Mission Song. Very, very missions-minded uh, church organization. Um, again, these I'm not mentioning these because we would agree with all of these. Uh, we would not, uh, you know, we would not agree with the Christian and Missionary Alliance on a number of issues. Uh, but they were used in these early years, especially in area in the area of, of missions. Um, moving on, just again, uh, some uh, some significant organizations that were started, and really a lot of these are are American organizations. And I say that because in some ways the passing of the torch from the great century into the era of the the 20th century, a lot of the mission work 
in the 20th century was spearheaded uh, by Americans. It was kind of like the great century. A lot of them were from England or Britain, uh, the, 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 uh, the United Kingdom, Mary Slessor, David Livingston, C.T. Studd, a lot of these. But you do have a shift. So Baptism and Missions, for example, this is a, this is a mission board that still exists today. It would actually still call itself fundamental. Um, my uncle was the president of Baptist Men Missions for, uh, for several years. They were missionaries in, the, in Africa uh, about the mid, late, I don't know, I forget now, 1960s and 70s or so. Uh, but it's a mission board that is still exists today, has a few hundred missionaries uh, all over the world. Uh, e. Stanley Jones was a well-known name in missions. Uh, I don't know what to think about him. He was widely lauded in his day. Um, I don't know. I've never been super impressed, but anyway, he was very significant. ABWE here, Association uh, of Baptists for World Evangelism. Actually, they started in the Philippines. Uh, the story, if I understand it, was there was a doctor who was with, I think, the American Baptist Board, and it was a liberal board, but he was a genuine Christian. And uh, he was working as a medical doctor in the Philippines, wanting to do mission work. But his liberal board, this is in the 1920s, his liberal American Baptist board was saying, okay, you can't really preach the gospel because you might offend people. You're there to do mission work. You're not there. I mean, sorry, you're there to do medical work. Uh, you're not there to preach the gospel. Well, this doctor said, I am there to preach the gospel. <laughs> and so he actually ended up leaving his liberal American Baptist board and um, uh, basically starting another board that became known as the Associ Association of Baptists for World Evangelism. And there's been a lot of mission work done in the Philippines by ABWE and even now across, across the world. For a number of years, they were fundamental. They've drifted a little bit really from uh, more conservative uh, circles. Um, I just wanted to show you this to you in part uh, so you could see here, for example, the first Christian radio station. Uh, so as missions, you know, the 20th century missions is taking advantage of technology, technology like radio, which to us is, uh, is old, right? Uh, but, you know, as radio comes into its heyday, uh, okay, so missions is now uh, laying hold of the opportunity to use uh, radio for the cause of Christ. Uh, we mentioned Gladys Aylward uh, earlier going to uh, China in, in the 19. Uh, 30s. The Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, you may have heard of this uh, under the name Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe Bible uh, Translators. Uh, there are still a number of Wycliffe Bible Translators around the world. Uh, their burden, of course, was to translate the Bible. They're still at it. Uh, there are stations of Bible, uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators in the Philippines and in other countries where they're still uh, trying to get the Bible into the languages of the world. And so started by a man named William uh, Cameron. So they tend to have a, a translation philosophy that is much more dynamic equivalent, not really formal equivalents, uh, but they have had a burden uh, to get the Bible into the languages of the world. So again, just showing you this, this is some of the some of the ways in which missions expanded, doing radio, doing Bible translation. Uh, New Tribes Mission, this was a burden for the tribal people is what led to the, the start of New Tribes Mission. Today, uh, this is known as Ethnos 360 is the new name of a New Tribes Mission, but, but was started with the burden, okay, how do we reach tribal people? Uh, not thinking cities as much, but but tribes in rugged places where you have to live differently in order to even live there. How do you do that? That was the burden of New Tribes Mission, uh, Mission Aviation Fellowship. I just I show this to you because this is this is where okay 1940s and and airplanes increasingly are are becoming a thing or becoming more common. So let's use aviation in missions. And you can, you can imagine that, that the focus to reach tribes and the, the ability to use airplanes, how that, how that came together. Uh, and, and so you have Mission Aviation Fellowship and you have others that are uh, using uh, airplanes as well. Um, today, you still have Mission Aviation Fellowship. It's often just called MAF. 
Um, not exactly in our circles, but uh, they do still do fly missions, uh, fly missionaries. New Tribes Mission actually also has its own airplanes that they use in different countries. Uh, actually, some of our missionaries with, with GFA uh, they in, in Papua New Guinea, uh, they use New Tribes Mission airplanes and pilots to get them uh, to some of their uh, stations just because it's, it's hard to have uh, your own airplane. So we do have missionaries with our board, GFA, that are there who uh, some of them are licensed pilots. And uh, we are hoping in the next few years that they can actually have their own plane. So they worked for years to get an airstrip where they live in the mountains. Because um, it's, I mean, it's just mountain and you, you know, of course, it's hard to build an airstrip and clear off the necessary mountain and be able to actually fly a plane in there. Uh, but they were able to do it a few years ago, they completed the airstrip. And in fact, if you go to our website, gfamissions.org, I believe one of the pictures that you'll see, like as you, as the, as the website plays, you'll see uh, like a plane landing on this mountain airstrip. And uh, that is, uh, that's in Papua New Guinea. Um, so again, just the idea of using uh, airplanes in, in missions. Um, Amy Carmichael dies uh, in 1951. I showed you a picture of her earlier. Uh, Brother Andrew, some of you have heard of Brother Andrew. I think he just, didn't he just die? I think he just died recently. He was in his 90s uh, when he passed away, but greatly used. You might have might have uh, heard the book or seen the book, God's Bible Smuggler. Uh, this was Brother Andrew. He would tell the stories of how he went into communist Eastern Europe. Um, he would go in, he would go by car. His car would be full of Bibles. Um, he would pray. He did not. He believed that you should not be dishonest there at the borders. Um, so he would not lie, but he would pray and he would just ask God to blind the eyes of the officials at the border. And uh, so he has all kinds of stories how he would pull up to the border crossing, going into the old Soviet Union. And for some reason, they would just wave his car through or they would search his car, but they would they wouldn't see the Bibles or they wouldn't check the place where there were Bibles or whatever. And, and he would make his way into communist Soviet Union and, and all kinds of stories. Um, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he shifted his focus uh, more uh, into uh, reaching Islamic people and, um, and, and had a heart for them. So anyway, a man who spent his life uh, in very creative ways uh, trying to get the gospel uh, in, into the world. Of course, the five missionaries that were killed in Ecuador, uh, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, uh, you've heard of their names and their stories. Elizabeth Elliott uh, made Jim Elliott famous in many ways by uh, publishing his writings and then writing about his life, uh, the shadow of the Almighty through Gates of Splendor, and then a lot of her writings for ladies. Um, but of course, the death of these five missionaries had a huge impact in the middle of the 20th century and resulted in a number of people surrendering to missionary service. Uh, and when they heard the story of the, the, the martyrdom of these five men who were trying to reach the Aka Indians in, in Ecuador. Um, you have a growing uh, international focus, okay? And this is kind of significant as we think about passing the torch and uh, I mentioned how a lot of what took place in the 20th century uh, was American missions. Uh, and it's toward the end of that 20th century that you, you have a growing world focus. You can see here this uh, idea of this uh, international, uh, international Congress for World Evangelization. Um, and then Ralph Winter starts this U.S. Center for World Mission. Um, again, not all of these are conservative. I'm not recommending these uh, to us, but just talking through some of the things that uh, happened in, in missions. Um, the Campus Crusades Jesus film. Uh, Bill Bright, uh, by the way, years ago, Bill Bright was, and Dr. Bob Jones Sr., I don't know if I should use the word friend, um, in fact, I, I didn't check on this. I, Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade, he might have even been a Bob Jones graduate. Um, uh, but anyway, the Jesus film of Campus Crusade has been translated into, I don't know how many languages, has been shown, I don't know how many millions of times, um, and has had an impact in, in missions. 
uh, as there are places where maybe uh, you can't do anything else, but people will let you show the Jesus film. It's been shown all over the world, again, in, in unbelievably rugged, uh, primitive, and even restricted uh, settings. Um, and again, here's the second international uh, congress, and look at where it's held. It's held in Manila in 1989. Uh, so uh, this, you know, of course, Philippines, but th th this would be Asia. So they decide, I mean, the first International Congress, Lausanne, was held in Europe. The second one is held 15 years later is held where? It's held in Asia. Uh, there's some significance in that, uh, that there's a growing recognition of, of increasing numbers of missions minded and missions burdened evangelical Christian believers in Asia represents something of a shift as we're thinking of this idea of passing the torch. A very significant, I'll show you a picture of this in a little bit, but the 1040 window, a concept that was popularized by a man named Lewis Bush in 1990. Um, again, some other events. Back to Jerusalem. I don't know if you've read this book. I've read through this book. I read, back to, I read through it a number of years ago. Uh, back to Jerusalem, published by three Chinese church leaders, house church leaders. One of them is called the, the Heavenly Man. Um, in my opinion, very charismatic. Um, so not in our, you know, not in our stripe uh, at all, but very significant because of their burden to take the gospel back to Jerusalem. And this is the burden of these three Chinese house church leaders. And, um, they, the way they put it, as I remember in the book, is that, okay, we're part of the persecuted Chinese church. We're used to persecution. Well, uh, the gospel has gone around the world. This is what they say. So the gospel left Jerusalem, and the gospel went, went west, and the gospel went across the Aegean Sea by the Apostle Paul to Europe, and then, you know, crossing uh, over the French Channel into Britain. Uh, the United Kingdom, and then it crossed the world into North America, Canada, and, uh, and, and the United States, and, and some in South America, and then uh, crossed, the, crossed the Pacific Ocean and into Asia, came coming into China and Japan and the Philippines and Korea. But really, there's been very little gospel work from China going uh, back to Jerusalem. I mean, you think of the countries in between, uh, countries like you know, Pakistan and, and India and all these Stan countries, Tajikistan and these other countries, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, Jordan, how much gospel work has been done in these very Islamic lands. And so the burden of these Chinese church leaders, okay, we're going to take the gospel back to Jerusalem. We're going to take the gospel from China to Jerusalem. Is it going to be hard? Yes. Is there going to be persecution? Yes. Will people die? Yes. But we're used to persecution. We're part of the underground house church movement in China. And so, and they, they, they even talk about in the book about training people to get ready for persecution as they do mission work. They talk about teaching people how to get out of handcuffs because, you know, you're going to be handcuffed for the cause of Christ. Um, they talk about, they teach people, uh, at least in the book, they talked about teaching people how to jump out of two-story buildings without without getting hurt because you know you're probably going to be uh you know there may be a time when you need to escape and you need to know how to jump out of a two-story building and not and not get hurt and this is the burden of this back to jerusalem movement and i don't know what's happened in the last 20 years with this movement but this book was published in 2003 i mentioned earlier patrick fung a significant development was uh, Patrick Fung becoming the first Asian general director of Overseas Missionary Fellowship. That was in 2006, would be his first official year as general uh, director. And then you had the World, the World Missionary Conference, uh, was held very ecumenical, uh, but uh, in some ways that marked a, kind of a marker of the end of that, the century here that we were looking at, 1910 to 2010. And again, I asked this question, to whom? Will the torch be passed? 
the 20th century, we had the likes of Amy Carmichael and Gladys Aylward and Isabel, John and Isabel Kuhn. We had Jonathan Goforth and, and uh, C.T. Studd and some of these others that, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, but now we're coming in, you know, we're well into the 21st century. To whom will the torch be passed? And um, here's kind of a fun little uh, global quiz. And this is from a few years ago, so I don't know how up to date this is. But, uh, you know, if I were to give you this quiz, what would you, you know, think if the world's population were reduced to 100 people? Okay, so just think if it took, uh, took the world's population and um, kind of according as the world is, but it was only 100 people, how many of the 100 people would be Asian? How many would be European? How many would be African? How many would be American? How many would be white? How many would be malnourished? How many would live in a below standard housing condition? How many would be unable to read? How many would hold a university degree? Well, this is what I came up with a few years ago. Out of 100 people, 57 would be Asian. I'm guessing that number is higher today. 21 would be European, eight would be African, two of the 100 would be American. 30 would be white, 50 would be of the 100 would be malnourished. 80 would live, out of, out of 100 would live below in below standard housing condition. 70 of the 100 would be unable to read and one of the 100 would hold a university degree. Okay, think of, think of those of us in this Zoom room today. I mean, how many, how many of us hold a university degree? Okay, we are, we are the world's minority. But I do want you to see this. How many would be Asian? And I want you to see this, the 50, the number 57. And I again, I think that's higher. I need to kind of update that number. But think of that. You know, and again, we talk about, you know, the passing of the torch. Who will the torch be passed to? Well, what's happening in our world? Where are the population shifts taking place? Where, you know, where is the gospel going? And, you know, we, we do have some things that have happened in our world in the last 20 years, right? We have uh, September 11, 9-11, we call it, fanatical Islam. I mentioned back to Jerusalem. I mentioned the Asian director of OMF appointed. These are, these are things that are happening in the last uh, 20 years. The increasing drop in giving. Uh, this affects missions. There's less money being given uh, to nonprofit organizations. That includes missions and, and mission movements. Um, there's increasing volatility as we think about what lies ahead uh, in missions. What do we, what do we see happening uh, in the future if we were to look into our day? Well, there's increasing volatility in confronting anti-Christian religions. I mean, think of what's happening uh, as now, as people go in as missionaries, increasing number of people being killed, um, being martyrs of the Christian faith is not a thing of the past. It's a thing of the present. In fact, many would argue there are more people being killed in the name of religion today than ever in history. Um, I think of just a, several, a few years ago, a few to several years ago, there was a pastor, his wife, and two children that were all killed in the southern Philippines. He was a pastor, a Christian pastor, killed by Islamic terrorists. All they were they were riding a motorcycle. The whole family was taken out and and executed. Um, so this is increasing volatility as we as we look at missions in the future. It's going to be increasingly risky. Um, there's a shift from Western to developing world missions. In other words, we have an increasing number of missionaries going from places like the Philippines, for example, from places in South America, Korea, uh, Singapore, all of these. Um, of course, Singapore is not really a part of the developing world, neither is Korea. But, but you have this shift from Western uh, missions to uh, other parts of the world. There's incre increasing creativity and in accessing closed countries. Uh, we have people teaching English 
as a way to get into closed countries. We have people that open businesses in order to get into closed countries. I heard of a guy who opened a car rental business in a closed country as a way. So he was serving tourists by uh, renting them cars, but he's, an, he's a missionary. You have people that have opened coffee shops uh, in order to be in restricted uh, in restricted nations. So there's increasing creativity in getting into countries that are so-called closed, realizing that we can't just say that they're closed and not try. We have to find creative ways of getting in. There's a diversity in funding missions increasingly. Uh, again, as, as money dries up in the West, less money being given uh, to missions and, and, and nonprofit organizations, there's increasing diversity. Um, I talked to an Indian gentleman um, several years ago, actually in Singapore during a conference, but uh, he mentioned how he has started a business uh, and the goal of the business is to try to generate the funds that are needed so to keep missions going in India because there's just less money available that's being given toward mission work uh, from typical Western uh, channels. Uh, so these are some of the things that are happening. There's, there's fewer big lighthouses, so to speak, uh, we need all lower lights to burn. You know, it's like that song, let the lower lights be burning. Uh, you know, in some ways, maybe we don't have the big names anymore, so to speak. We don't have the Amy Carmichaels and the Gladys Aylwards and, and the John and Isabel Coons and the David Livingstons. And um, uh, we, we don't maybe have the big lighthouses, but we need all the lower lights burning brightly. We need, uh, like I mentioned here, we, the imperative of every believer evangelism. We need, we need every believer doing their work in the Great Commission. Every believer uh, needs to feel the imperative. Every believer needs to live as a kingdom Christian. Every believer needs to reach out to the people around them in the circles where God has put them and let God use them. Um, uh, increasing prayer to see new frontiers opened. Again, some of these uh, countries are not going to be reached except through prayer. Uh, it's like what uh, what what uh, Hudson Taylor, I believe, said to Jonathan Goforth when he was going into a very difficult uh, province in China. And Hudson Taylor wrote and said, go forward, but go forward on your knees. And it's going to require going forward on our knees uh, if we're going to see some of these uh, places uh, reached. Um, and then we're going to need spirit-given courage and risky missions thrust. Uh, increasingly, there is a need uh, to take risk. Uh, uh, tomorrow, our mission board will have a virtual roundtable uh, called "Is Risk Is Risk in Missions Worth It?" Um, and it'll be uh, there'll be four missionaries who'll be talking about the issue of risk in missions. Is is mission is risk worth it in missions? Um, it's going to take risk. It, it's going to cost life. It's going to cost. It's going to there's going to be bloodshed uh, if we're going to keep reaching our our volatile. Uh, fragile, anti-Christian uh, world. And I mentioned earlier this idea, a lot of the risk is going to be involved in reaching what's called the 1040 window. What is the 1040 window? Well, you can see an example there. The 1040 window um, is an imaginary box uh, that's drawn between 10 and 40 degrees of, long, of, of longitude and about 62 countries, uh, parts of the countries are in that. And really this, you know, when you, when you see this, 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 these line, this box uh, that you have here, and this is the box that we call the, the, the 1040 window. Again, here, if I just kind of put a circle, that's that 1040 window. Uh, but look at the countries there. These are the countries that haven't been reached. Um, and again, there are other countries as well, but this, this became a focus in the 1990s. Um, these are gonna be hard countries to reach. Uh, these are uh, largely Islamic countries, especially as you get into the Middle East and in Northern Africa. Uh, India, though, has has you know almost a billion Hindus in India. Uh, India will soon be, uh, they say, the world's most populous Muslim country as well. As there's gr there's a growing. Uh, 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 Islam is growing rapidly in India. India will soon be the world's most populous country as it overtakes China here uh, in the next several years. So this is a part of our world that desperately needs to be reached. And the honest truth is there's not a lot being done for missions 
uh, in this area. Um, here's an older estimate, um, over 4 billion people. In fact, I think uh, today it's gonna almost be almost 5 billion, but like 4.6 or I'm not even sure. Uh, but two thirds of the world population live in the 1040 window. 55 of the countries are what's called least evangelized. Uh, this part of our world is the epicenter of Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. 82% um, of the world's poorest live here. Um, you've got low quality of life. So here's, you know, here's least evangelized. Here's the world's, the, 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 the majority, uh, the great majority, the super majority, we could say, of the world's population. And yet about 3% of the missions force goes to this part of the world. 97% of the global missionary force is in other parts of the world, in other words. And one estimated that five cents of every $1,000 given goes toward reaching the 1 billion Muslims there. Five cents. I mean, here's $1,000 being given toward missions. And maybe five cents of that is going toward reaching the 1 billion Muslims in, in this area. So this is, this is an area to pray about. This is an area to focus on. And again, you know, asking this question, to whom uh, will the torch be passed? Well, it's going to be those who are willing uh, to take a risk. But I mentioned earlier, really a spirit-given courage to take risks. And I think of this passage that the Lord actually ministered to me in my devotions yesterday as I was reading. This is from the book of Zechariah. As Zachar, as Zerubbabel is facing an, an insurmountable task to rebuild the temple, humanly impossible, very difficult. And yet God gives Zechariah this vision that he is to then share with Zerubbabel. And this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying, not by might, okay, not by capacity. This word is translated different ways in the Old Testament. Not, not by might, not by any of your capacity. Not by your capacity with words, not by your not by your capacity with money, not by your capacity with education, not by any human capacity, not by power. Okay, not going to be by sheer strength or force or even human energy, but by my spirit, by the spirit of the Lord of hosts, by his spirit, this great task is going to be accomplished. Who art thou, O great mountain? This, again, is the insurmountable task that Zerubbabel faced in rebuilding the temple. Here was this great mountain, this insurmountable task, uh, uh, they, uh, trying to get this temple rebuilt. Well, by the power of God's spirit, by my spirit, this great mountain shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. Meaning, meaning he was going to see the job. Uh, finished. But it was not going to be by might, not going to be by human capacity, not going to be by human strength. It's going to be by my spirit, saith the Lord of, of hosts. So that's what it's going to take as missions uh, moves forward in the 21st century. So may may we be volunteers. May we be those who, like, uh, like Isaiah said, here am I, uh, send, send me. So that ends our, our history of missions, and uh, I hope that that's been a help uh, to us. And uh, what, if we, what if we pray and then uh, just open up if there's any questions and comments here. Lord, please use us in our day and raise up a new generation, a new era of missionaries who are willing uh, to be used by you. And who are willing to say, okay, I, I can't do it, but by God's spirit, I, I can. And uh, Lord, would you give us, would you raise up laborers? And Lord, I just think of think of uh, churches, Lord, here in America. I think of churches in Singapore, Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Korea. Lord, I pray for those ministries that are, are really holding to, to truth, holding to the pattern of sound doctrine. Lord, I, I lift up these churches especially, Lord, those that we would consider to be true, uh, true bearers of, of evangelical Christianity who, who are, are, are wanting to take a holy separated stand. Lord, I pray, I pray for our churches especially that are like this, that out of these churches, you would raise up laborers, 
that you would thrust forth men and women from these churches who would be willing to set themselves apart to work that the Holy Spirit is calling them and empowering them to do. Lord, give us laborers for today. Lord, we love to hear about what was done in the past. So we, we love reading the writings of people like Amy Carmichael and Isabel Kuhn and Elizabeth Elliot and all these others that have gone before us. But Lord, we want to see you do a work in our day. Lord, the same spirit that helped Zerubbabel is, is alive in our day. The same spirit that empowered people like Robert Morrison is, is still much, very much active and alive in our day. And we pray, oh God, that you would uh, stir our churches and stir our people and stir our young people. And Lord, even those of us that are more middle-aged, Lord, I think of C.T. Studd, who at age 50, after 50, did his greatest mission work. Lord, would you use us? Would you put us where you want us? Lord, lead us into the fields of the world. Help us to lay our lives down for you. Um, for the sake of the souls of, of in our world, we, for the sake of our Lord Jesus, who gave us life for these, for, for, for the sake of, of your name, that your name would be glorified in all the earth, at all these places that do not re, that do not recognize Jesus as their Lord, but yet He, Lord, in the Word and in, in, in your in the Bible, it says that. Um, you say of, uh, to uh, ask of me, he said, and I'll give you the nations uh, as your inheritance. Lord, you've promised the nations to be his inheritance. Lord, all of these, we could, any any place we could think of, Lord, Mecca, Baghdad, um, Thailand, uh, any of these places, Lord, all of these are, are part of Christ's inheritance. He is king of the earth. And yet they reject his lordship. And we pray for the sake of his name, for the sake of these souls, for the, the, the sake of what he did on the cross. Lord, we pray that for these reasons, Lord, you would be stirring in our churches, in our movements, in our colleges, and raising up the next generation of laborers. Lord, we pray. Give us a great missions thrust. And but even as we recognize all that you're doing in, in Asia, Lord, the passing of the torch, where will that torch be passed to? I pray that even, even in Asia, that torch would be picked up and would be carried on uh, as we try to take the gospel into some of the world's most difficult countries. Or give, us a, give us a willingness to take risk. Give us a willingness to get, give us courage. Give us spirit-led courage. Or not just, not just human courage. Uh, not just a desire to be a hero. Uh, but spirit-given courage uh, that is willing to rise to the challenge. Uh, the challenges we face in our world. So, Father, we are crying out to you, realizing that this is... This is where we need to be at your throne. This is where missions begins, um, is at your throne. And we are asking, oh God, that you would do a work and you would start that work with us. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.